Okay, so um, I don't know if the rest of you heard me, but I was saying to Dana that I'm working within um, virtue epistemology. Um, so what I'm doing in this talk is I'm going to identify, uh, well, two, two main problems with an account in virtue epistemology, uh, John Greco's account. Um, and I'm going to try and look for a solution that stays within the framework of virtue epistemology. So this is the structure of the talk. So first I'm going to give some background on the Gettier problem and virtue epistemology. So you know we can all start on the same page. Um, I want to talk to you so that if you don't know much about, even if you don't know much about analytic epistemology, then you should be able to get the main ideas that are expressed here. Um, and if you know nothing about virtue epistemology, then hopefully at the end you'll come away with some ideas. Um, so then I'm going to look at Greco's proposed solution, so solution to the Gettier problem. Um, and then I'm going to look at uh, two problems with that solution. So the first problem is uh, the Barney case, and the second problem is case of testimonial knowledge. And then finally I'll offer my own solution. Okay, so it's uncontroversial within analytic uh, epistemology that if a person knows that piece, if they know a proposition, um, then they, that means that they have true belief um, that be. So for example, um, if I say that John knows that it's raining outside, then that just implies that John believes it's raining outside. Um, right, so if John didn't even believe it was raining inside, we wouldn't say that he knows it's raining inside. And it also entails that it's true that it's raining inside. Uh, so similarly, we wouldn't say that John knows that it's raining outside, if actually it's not raining outside, that wouldn't make any sense. Um, so this is, this is very uncontroversial in analytic epistemology. There are some cases where people say, well, you know, maybe there might be some cases where it's not as clear that uh, you can't have uh, knowledge without a belief that P, but I'm not really going to look at those cases. They're there's very few people within the debate that think that's correct. If you want to ask me about it, that's fine. I'll tell you more about those cases and I can say why I don't think they're uh, persuasive. But this is really sad. Um, before Gettier, it was taught that uh, justified true belief was uh, necessary and jointly sufficient for knowledge. So everyone basically was agreeing that you need to have true belief to have knowledge. Um, and a standard position was that um, you couldn't just have true belief, you also had, a, had to have justified true belief to have knowledge. But may I ask you? Yeah. Uh, uh, do you agree with people who attribute this point of view to Plato, that knowledge is justified true belief? Yeah, that's right. So people do uh, attribute that view to Plato. Um, I think what Plato means by justification is different from how other people use justification. Uh, so for example, in the Mino, he talks about the difference between knowledge um, and true belief being that uh, a person who has knowledge has explanatory reasons. Um, so they have explanatory reasons to, to tie down true belief. Um, in that, in that um, work, he's also talking about the value of knowledge. Um, so yeah, um, I think if you have an internalist conception of justification, then you might think, yeah, um, that's that's what, that's correct, um, that's what Plato meant. Um, but if you have an externalist conception of justification, um, then that will be, uh, you might think that that's what Plato meant. Um, but you'll have different reasons for not, not going along with it um, when it's understood that way. Uh, so let me explain a little bit. So, um, externalists think that justification is something that is determined external to the person. Um, so it doesn't depend on uh, someone um, you know, thinking, oh, well, I have a good reason 
to believe this. That doesn't, that's not what justification means. Uh, justification, if someone has a justified belief, that means that um, it's conforming to some uh, objective standard. Uh, so they're forming their belief uh, on the basis of a reliable process, for example. But this, so this is slightly um, tangential. Um, yeah, before, before I continue, just if I'm speaking too quickly or if you have a question of a clarificatory nature, uh, then please just raise your hand. Um, and then as well, if you have like a, a question more about the content, maybe you disagree with something that's been said, um, then we can have that in the discussion period. Okay, so pre gettier one of the one of the views was that the standard view uh, was that knowledge was justified true belief. So why think that true belief isn't enough? Well, the idea was that look, it could just happen to be the case that someone is right about what they believe. So, for example, um, imagine. I'm prone to wishful thinking, right? So I end up believing things that I really, really want to be true. Um, so um, let's say I'm, I'm in Russia and I haven't been able to check the news, so I don't know how my football team has done. And um, I just form, I formed a belief because I'm prone to wishful thinking that my, my football team has won their match. Um, well, his small just wouldn't say that that person has knowledge. They have a true belief, right? So it could turn out that it's actually true. The team um, I support, the team I like, won their match. So I have a true belief, but that's not sufficient. Um, that, that doesn't go far enough um, for me to have knowledge. And so the idea is, well, you need something else. You need justification. Uh, so sometimes, um, when people talk about mere true belief, the, the reason that they give um, for saying that that's not sufficient for knowledge is that, well, it could just accidentally turn out to be the case um, that you're right, or it, you could just be lucky that your belief is true. Okay, so this actually brings us on nicely to the next point. So, Gettier provided a strong counter example, actually a few strong counter examples to the JCB account. Um, so remember I said, well, the problem with just having a true belief is that it could just luckily turn out to be the case, you know, accidentally it could turn out that your, your belief is right. Um, well, Gettier gave cases where there's a justified true belief, and one diagnosis is, um, it's, it, we don't want to say that it's knowledge because um, the person that the person's belief is true is just a matter of luck. So let me let me explain the case. So um, this follows the structure of a Gettier case, this Roddy case. So imagine that there's a person uh, looking into a field. You can have the typed version as well. So imagine that there's a person looking into a field, and he forms his belief on the basis of his perception. His perception is reliable. Um, and, you know, we, we think that that's, that's a fine way of forming your beliefs on the basis of your perception. It's not like the weather conditions are really bad in this case. It's not like it's really foggy. He just stuck into the field, forms his belief. And uh, he forms a belief that uh, there's a sheep in the field. Um, and it turns out there actually is a sheep in the field. But what he's looking at is actually just a sheep-shaped object. It's not an actual sheep, but behind that object is an actual sheep. Uh, so what's really interesting about this case um, is that the three things that were taught to be jointly sufficient for knowledge are all present. So um, in the case, the, the person has a true belief and they also have a justified belief. Uh, they form their belief on the basis of the reliable perception. So it's a counter example to um, this, this standard account, this JTB account. And basically a lot of epistemology since then um, has been trying to deal with this type of case. This case where there's a justified true belief but we don't think that there's knowledge. Uh, so. 
the diagram. Yeah. The Lord D, uh, sees an object, uh, uh, not the sheep. Uh, his belief is not true. <laughs> but sheep I, I, is. Yes, yes, but uh, he sees not this sheep. And his belief is not true. His justification is not relevant. But his belief that there is a sheep on the field is true. But actually, we, if we take the proposition, I saw the sheep, it's not a true belief. Because he thinks that he saw the sheep, but actually he, don't he doesn't see the uh, sheep. So so we, we, we can just false. say that the, um, that the belief is that there is a sheep in the field. That yes, can be a the proposition. There is a uh, sheep in the field, yes. His knowledge is not. I see yes, the yes, yes. His knowledge That's is important. there is a ship. Yes, yes. Yeah, so actually, um, one early approach was to say that actually um, you need to be, uh, your belief needs to be directly related to the truth maker. Um, so that would go some way to uh, respond to what was said um, that uh, maybe the problem is that um, the way that they formed their belief um, wasn't good because. Uh, what they based their belief on, uh, you know, was misleading or something. Or the truth, it, it wasn't related to the, to the truth maker. Um, but there are other cases where it can be. So actually, we'll look at one case, the, the Barney case later on, um, and that's a case where the person is actually looking at the object. Um, it's not like they're looking at something they think is something else uh, that they think is, say, a sheep. They're actually looking at the object, and they're right about what they're looking at. Um, that's also uh, considered a, um, a count, for example, to the standard count. Uh, but we'll, we'll come to that anyway. His belief is contingently true. Accidentally. Accidentally. Yeah, right. So that, that's one, one diagnosis that, uh, look, the problem is that, uh, yes, the person has a justified belief. They form their beliefs on the basis of uh, perception. Um, and they have a true belief. There is a sheep in the field, uh, but the two aren't connected the way they should be. Uh, so it just turns out that their belief that there's a sheep in the field is true, it's accidental. And so the diagnosis is that there's some problem with the justification con uh, condition. So one, um, one approach, and actually the one that we'll be looking at, um, is it, it takes, the, um, takes the line of saying that, well, we need a causal account. Um, so again, this is in the same spirit, I think, of, as what you're saying. Um, so we'll see more about that as well later. Okay, so post gettier epistemology has sought to provide um, an analysis of knowledge or an account of the nature of knowledge that deals satisfactorily with the Gettier problem. Uh, one approach is the inclusion of an anti-look condition. Um, so remember I was saying that one of the diagnoses is that, well, the problem here is that um, you know, this person is looking into the field, but it's just lucky that they have a true belief. Well, one approach is to say, okay, um, what we need is an anti-look condition. We need to say, yes, we need a justified true belief. And it also can't be the case that your belief is lucky. Um, so actually, it's more spelled out, the anti-look condition is, um, is a safety condition. So. Uh, formally, it's that your belief has to be formed in such a way that you couldn't have easily been wrong. Um, but one of the criticisms with this is that it looks ad hoc. It looks like, um, look, there are these strange cases, um, getting your cases, and we're trying to, we've died, we've found something about them, and we'll just say, and um, we can't have this thing, um, so we can't. It's like saying that we have just knowledge is justified true belief plus not a your case, which uh, doesn't look well motivated theoretically. It looks worse when you consider that we wouldn't want to rule out all cases of epistemic luck. So, for example, imagine that you just happen to be passing by your office, uh, your boss's office, um, and you overhear your boss speaking, and your boss says something like. Oh, I'm going to give um, Victor a, a great pay rise. Um, in that case, you're lucky to have heard this, um, but we don't want to say that that you're lucky to have heard this means that you can't know it now. Um, so actually, 
the anti-luck condition doesn't rule out all cases of luck. It rules out what's called uh, doxastic luck or environmental luck. So doxastic luck is just uh, luck that your belief was true. And environmental luck is uh, that you're lucky given that the environment that you're in. So again, when we come to the Barney case, you'll get an example of a case that where there's environmental luck in play. Um, but it doesn't rule out evidential luck. So you're not lucky. So having evidential luck, so being lucky that you got evidence, doesn't uh, stop you from having knowledge. So this makes the ad hoc criticism look even worse. That okay, so we say that um, well, our, our response to the Geyer case is to say, yeah, well, let's keep JTB. Let's say that knowledge is just by true belief and add an anti-luck condition. But now yeah, it's it's an it's a selective anti-luck condition, so it's not ruling out all cases of luck. It's only ruling out certain cases of luck. And um, so that's that's one reason why it's seen as at a theoretical disadvantage. It seems to be just identifying something very particular wrong in these cases and just saying, okay, not, not these. Okay, so before we get to um, one of the responses, Greco's response to the Gettier case, um, let's look a bit, look at uh, virtue epistemology. Let's just give, let me just give you a little bit of background. Uh, so, a virtue, uh, so a virtue epistemic account of knowledge uh, requires that there is a contribution greater than the cognitive character of the, cog of the cognitive agent to gaining knowledge. Right, so the idea, if it's a virtue epistemic account of knowledge, then the idea is, well, there must be some contribution uh, to the person knowing from the person's character, cognitive character. So, I'm committed to virtue epistemology as well, so I want to be able to give an answer that meets this requirement too. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, can we say that a virtue epistemic account is a kind of internalism? Um, well, actually, it's hard to say that because the, one of the accounts the account that we'll look at, Greco's account, um, is one where it's a mixed account, so there's an externalist element and an internalist element. Um, but it's there's conceptual space there just to give an externalist account. Um, so, so for Greco, so he thinks that the way we should understand virtue is that um, the agent has certain abilities. And so he thinks of um, perception or memory or introspection as being abilities um, and what will make the, them justified is if they're reliable so actually he thinks that if we really want to say their, their abilities then they should um, reliably produce a preponderance of true beliefs over false beliefs and um, so actually it, it would be possible just to say that um, in which case it needn't be the case that um, someone has access um, to the grounds of them believing that they, um, it could just be that um, they reliably produce true nobility, um, these true beliefs that, that they are whatever, about whatever. Um, but again, I'll, I'll, come, I'll say more about this um, in, a, in a few slides time. Okay, so there are two approaches in literature. One is robust, robust virtue epistemology. So, Robust virtue epistemology tries to solve the Gettier case without making reference to an anti luck condition. Um, so essentially, it tries to explain um, how someone has knowledge on the basis of an ability condition. And weak virtue epistemology says yes, uh, virtue epistemology is correct insofar that uh, the agent does have to make uh, some contribution to them having a true belief for them to have knowledge, the right kind of contribution. Um, but that alone isn't going to help us with some of the problem cases. And so the weak virtue epistemology says um, we also need an anti luck condition. Okay, Greco's account. 
So Greco, Greco's alternative to the JTB account knowledge. So S knows that B, if and only if S truly believes because of S's reliable cognitive abilities. Right. So S knows that B, if and only if S, S believes truly because of S's reliable cognitive abilities. So the, the causal uh, connection is, is essential. Um, so for Greco, he doesn't want to say it can just be the case that you have true belief and you've uh, exercised abilities. That's not going to come out as knowledge on Greco's account. Okay, so the example here is S is believing the truth that 28 multiplied by 9 is 252 is explained by S is believing from ability, more specifically a reliable cognitive ability. Um, so another way of cashing out because the because of relation is uh, to say explained by. Um, so basically what's, what he's getting at is something can have lots of causes, but what's important is what's causally salient. So for example, um, you might ask, why did the glass break? Um, and I might say, well, it broke because I, I pushed it off the table. Um, and so in that case, me pushing it off the table is what's salient, it's what's causally salient, and it's what explains why the glass broke. But of course, the glass breaking has many causes, like, you know, that it's fragile, um, that the, the distance was great, or whatever else. Okay. Uh, sorry. Yeah? How do you compare with some um, DTF cases, such solution? What ability is unreliable, for example, in case of fraud? Yeah, so actually what Greco, let me see if I actually have this in the slide. Uh, yeah, well I come to it at some point. Okay, so um, yeah, in the Roddy case, he's not saying that there isn't a justified belief there. So he does think that um, it is a Gettier case. He does think there's, J, there's JTB there. But what he's saying is that the problem in the, in the Roddy case is that the person doesn't have a true belief because of the exercise of their ability. They have a true belief and a justified belief, but the causal relation isn't there. So that's the solution. Actually, it's a really neat solution to that, to the standard Gettier cases. So to, to most of the Gettier cases. We'll talk about the Barney case later. Okay, so um, S knows that P, if and only if S believes truly because of S's reliable cognitive abilities. Um, but how should we understand reliable cognitive as a process grounded in the cognitive character of an agent and therefore stable that reliably produces true beliefs. Right, so ability implies reliability. So what does reliability mean? So um, what's meant by rely reliability? Um, so in this case, so when it's about uh, this uh, uh, cognitive um, cognitive uh, faculty, um, in this case it means that it produces a preponderance of true beliefs over false beliefs. So, like there is some issue, there's what's called the generality problem when it comes to reliability. Um, so you know, if someone asks you, well, you know, when exactly is reliable when it produces like true beliefs 90% of the time, does that mean it's reliable or does it need to produce true beliefs 91% of the time? Um, and there isn't really a very good answer to that, but the response is that, well, look, this is kind of this is a familiar problem. So we have the same kind of problem when we um, use other notions uh, such as heaps or baldness. It's very hard to point to exactly uh, when the point is, but that doesn't mean we should get rid of this notion. Um, okay, so what are the advantages of Greco's account? So a theoretical plus of the account is that no separate condition uh, is used for dealing with Gettier type cases. That is, there's no anti-look condition. So remember the worry with the anti-look condition was that it just seemed ad hoc. So um, it seemed like there were some problem cases and there was an attempt to just rule out those problem cases. And actually, um, it wasn't ruling out all epistemic luck. It was only ruling out certain kinds of epistemic luck. 
So the end looks nature not having to appeal to this anti-God condition. And also, in each account, the value of knowledge falls out of this account of the nature of knowledge. Um, I, w I won't go into this too much, but just to say that this is, it's also a concern of um, virtue of in particular, uh, but this, just, this debate is kind of, well, it has developed a lot over the last, say, five or six years. Um, Duncan Pritchard, uh, Greco, um, Tory, Van Vick, uh, so exactly different people have been discussing this a lot in recent, uh, recent papers. Um, and Greco's account looks really good because actually on Greco's account, uh, knowledge is an achievement. Uh, so he thinks that achievements are successes because of abilities and having a true belief because of your cognitive abilities um, is what knowledge is. So knowledge is an achievement that meets these criteria for achievements. And then he appeals to Aristotle, um, who argues that uh, achievements are finally valuable. So, um, or the way he puts it is that they're constitutive of the good life. So, the good life is rich in achievements. So then we get a really nice account of why knowledge is valuable, because it's an achievement. Again, it, I won't come back to this, but if you want to ask me more about it, then that's fine. Okay, so knowledge comes out as being creditable to the knowing agent. Uh, so this is something that also fits with our intuition. So it seems right to think that when someone knows something, um, they're in some way creditable, that you know, they've done something right. So it seems like um, you know, maybe praiseworthy in a certain sense. Okay, so now we're going to turn to the problems. So the first problem we're going to look at is the Barney case. Um, actually, when I was giving this talk in St. Petersburg, someone said uh, this should be the um, Potemkin village case. <laughs> uh, so you'll, you'll understand when you see the case. Uh, so using his reliable perceptual faculties, Barney non-inferentially forms the true belief that the object in front of him is a barn. And actually, it is a barn. He is looking at a barn. Uh, unbeknownst to Barney, however, he's in an area that's full of uh, barn facades, so fake barns. Um, and he's just happened to look at the one, one genuine, one genuine barn. Excuse me. In Russia, we are we, we are familiar with such uh, uh, unfriendly environment. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, we we call it Potemkin villages. Yeah, no, that's that's nice. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay, so, so he has seen this, he's seen this real barn, and he has a true belief that the barn is there, he's formed his belief on the basis of his perception, um, so, you know, it's a justified true belief. But the standard intuition among epistemologists is that Barney doesn't know in this case. Um, so to use the language of uh, epistemic luck, um, the way he formed his belief was such that he could have easily been wrong. So there is a broad consensus that this isn't the case of knowledge, but some epistemologists differ and say no, we should paint this as knowledge. Uh, so Sosa says that we should say this is animal knowledge, so it can't be reflective knowledge, but it's animal knowledge. Um, and then actually, when I gave uh, well, I did a different talk, but I had this Barney case to some postgraduates in Edinburgh. A lot of them actually had the intuition that we should say that this is a case of knowledge. Um, but generally, epistemologists say no, it's not knowledge, and I I, I agree with them. Um, I think maybe you can strengthen the case. Um, so, for example, you can imagine a thief who goes into a house and there's, you know, he wants to steal, steal something valuable and he opens a drawer and there's lots of jewellery um, and he forms the belief, oh, that's, that's really valuable, and he takes it. And it turns out that everything in the drawer except that was just fake. Um, <laughs> I think we'd say that he doesn't know in that case. Definitely. <laughs> 
Okay, so unlike in standard Gettier type cases, there appears to be a true belief because of the exercise of ability. Right? So that's what was really nice about Greco's accounts. He really nicely dealt with um, standard Gettier cases. He just said, well, look, the problem in the Roddy case is that the person doesn't have a true belief because of the exercise of their ability. They just happen to have a true belief and have exercised their ability. But this case isn't like that. It does seem that the person has a true belief because of the exercise of their ability. Sorry, one question. And if we make the person to know that there are a lot of fake bars around it, uh, in that case, uh, it, uh, it uh, will always be a uh, false belief, even if he knows that there are a lot of false bars. Um, say if he knows that he's in this yes, area, yes. like yes. he knows he's in a Hollywood set or something. Um, we, like, we'd imagine that he wouldn't form the belief that there's a bar in front of him then, but just say he did. Um, well, if it really is a bar, it would still be true. So the idea is that the true condition is based on uh, mind-independent reality. So, you know, there are some sort of strange cases, but generally what's true doesn't depend on what you believe one way or another. Um, so if he knew that he was in this environment, but he still for some reason believed that there was a bar in front of him, um, then we could say he still has a true belief. Um, we might question whether he has a justified belief. I, I guess we would say he doesn't have a justified belief in that case. Okay, so Pritchard argues that Greco's criterion for knowledge is met so Greco's criterion was uh, if S knows that P, uh, sorry, F, S um, knows that P if and only if S believes truly because of ability. So Greco says that this, this is met, and this is that, that kind of case, there is a true belief because of cognitive ability. The standard intuition among epistemologists is the protagonists in Barney type guesses don't know. Uh, so Greco um, has responded to this criticism. Uh, he says that abilities are environment relative, and it's not clear that Barney has um, the relevant ability. So what does he mean by saying abilities are environment relative? Well, he gives various examples. So one example is um, Tiger Woods. So we say that Tiger Woods has an ability uh, to, to push in golf, to put, you know, so pushing when he's on the green, um, he can put in golf, he has this ability. Um, and it's fine to say that, but um, we should remember that that doesn't imply that he, he has that ability in, um, say, on, say, the moon, for example, or in hurricane force conditions. So Greco says, well, look, this just shows that abilities are environment relative. Um, Later on, Greco develops this idea of environment relative, and he says it can also mean condition relative. So uh, we might say this is a baseball example. I, I don't know why there are always sports examples, but they almost always are. Um, so we can imagine a baseball player, and you know, let's take, I don't know, the top baseball player in America, whoever that is, and um, we would say that he has an ability to hit what, what are they, to hit pitches, or whatever it is that baseball players do when the ball uh, comes to them. Um, but not under any conditions, so we can imagine that he doesn't have that ability if he's got loads of sand in his eyes, for example. So in this, this way, uh, Greco makes the case that abilities are environment relative. So, the worry with saying this is that it seems to endanger his, his nice response to the Roddy case. Right? So if you're saying that, well, you know, I don't know if, if Barney has an ability in this kind of environment where there are all these fake uh, barns around, all these barn facades, and that's my reason for saying that, oh, this is an account for example. It looks like you're going to have to say something similar about the Roddy case. You're going to have to say that actually the Roddy case 
is, a, is actually like the Barney case in that um, this looks like a bad environment to form a belief as well. There's this fake, um, fake sheep object in the field, uh, like as in the Barney case, there are these fake barns. Um, and we can say then, well, it just seems plausible then that um, we shouldn't say that the, the protagonist in this case has an ability for the same reason. So if we're going to say that there's not an ability in the Barney case, it looks like we should say the same about Roddy cases as well, or Sandra Gellier cases. Um, after all, the person forms their belief in the right kind of way, and it turns out that they're uh, it turns out that they're right, they're right, but not because of their um, because of their ability. Um, and if he has to say that, then it looks like he's giving up one of the, the theoretical advantages of his account that deals so nicely with the Roddy case or standard Gellier cases. Okay, so this looks like a theoretical cost, and it looks like a reason not, not to want to say this about Barney's type cases. There's also, um, there's also another reason to worry about what he says here. So this is an example given by Pritchard. Um, again, it's a, it's a baseball case. Um, and so the case is this, that, look, what's going wrong in uh, Barney cases is what's happening in a nearby environment. Um, so if you think of it modally, a nearby possible world. What's going wrong is that we say that the person could have easily been wrong because the, the way they formed their belief is such that um, forming the belief in that way in nearby worlds would have led to false beliefs. So when it comes to baseball case, or you can think of an archery case as well, so firing an arrow, um, we can imagine a case where someone hits a, hits a bullseye. So they're going for this target, they fire and they hit it, and we can even imagine them doing it consistently, or that they're able to do it consistently. Um, but if we go along with what Greco was saying, it looks like we shouldn't say that the person is doing that on the basis of ability. If, in nearby cases, wind would have blown um, the arrow off course. So you can imagine just someone lining up to take a shot, they fire, and in nearby worlds, a gust of wind would have blown the arrow away. Um, so that would mean that the, the way in which the person uh, fired the arrow is such that it could have easily missed the target. But it looks like you shouldn't want to say that. It looks like it shouldn't really matter um, what's happening in nearby um, possible worlds uh, for us to say whether the person has the ability to hit the target or not. Just so out of interest, do you, do you go along with that? So you imagine the, the archer firing and they can consistently hit the, the bullseye, but it could have been the case that in a nearby world, a gust of wind would have blown the arrow, of course. Uh, do you agree that we should say that, well, the person, even if that's the case, even if a wind could have blown the arrow away, we still want to say that the person is exercising ability in that case? Yeah? Right, so Pritchard's proposed solution to the Barney case is just to emphasize, look, this, is just, this just shows that we need this anti look condition, we need a safety condition. Greco's response is that it's ad hoc. Um, Pritchard's condition seems ad hoc in that a condition being added just to get the right results. It, it seems that a condition is being added just to get the right result in this strange per peripheral case. So it looks like it's not well, well motivated theoretically. So that's, that's the Barney case. So the next case, that's the problem for Greco's account. And it poses challenge generally to um, virtue epistemological accounts is testimonial knowledge. And so this is a case originally from 
Jennifer Lackey. Um, it's been adopted here by Pritchard. So um, our protagonist, whom we will call Jenny, arrives at a train station in Chicago and wants to see uh, the Sears Tower, so she's looking for directions. Um, she approaches the first passerby, adult passerby that she sees. Um, suppose further that the person that she asks has first-hand knowledge of the area and gives her directions, uh, the directions that she requires. Intuitively, any true belief that Jenny forms on this basis would ordinarily be counted as knowledge. Right, so she's asking an adult to pass her by for directions to Sears Tower, and they give her directions, and the thought is that, well, now she's formed her belief on the basis of um, this testimony, um, and we, we recount this as knowledge. The claim that it's knowledge is from Lackey, and it's also from Pritchard. This case is a bit more controversial. Some people want to challenge whether we really want to say that someone knows just on the basis of directions that they get. Um, if you don't like the particular case, we can come up with a stronger case where uh, it could be, say, um, a person asking, maybe they ask the policeman where where the serious harem is, or they ask at the tourist office where the serious harem is. Um, and so we would want to say that they, they know. So generally, uh, analytic epistemologists are committed to the idea that um, we can get testimonial knowledge and actually that um, we depend on testimony uh, for a large part of our knowledge. Uh, so generally, they don't want to say that skepticism is true. They want to say that we do know more or less what we take ourselves to know. Um, and the worry of saying that test, we don't get testimonial knowledge or that it's really hard to get knowledge from testimony is that it would just seem to rule out us knowing loads of things that we, we take ourselves to know. So for example, do I know that the French Revolution happened? I think so, um, but it's, that's based on testimony. Um, do I know my date of birth? I think so, but that's based on testimony. I did, it's not like I remember it. Um, do I know where my friends work? Well, I, you know, in some cases I've never been to their workplace, I just have their word for it. Uh, but I think I do know. So we don't relate those cases um, as being cases of knowledge. Um, so it looks like we have to say, that, okay, uh, we can get knowledge from, from testimony. The Jenny case poses a problem for the robust virtue of epistemic account because Jenny does not seem to gain a true belief in the appropriate way. So it doesn't seem like she's exercising ability when she's gaining, gaining belief. Um, and as such, her true belief doesn't seem appropriately creditable to her government agency. Right? So it's not like we would say, oh, well, that she knows where the Sears terror, terror is, is of creditor. She's not. We wouldn't say, uh, if, if we can use the language of change, but we wouldn't say that uh, she's praiseworthy uh, for that. It seems like the, the reason that she knows isn't because of her abilities. It seems like it's because of the person who told her. That's the statement factor. That explains why uh, she has a true belief about where the serious error is. And if anyone's creditable, that's the person who's credited. Yeah, so this is basically going over what it said. So it seems like um, Jenny's informant is the one is salient in explaining Jenny's true belief and how to get to the, the true belief about how to get to the terror. And it is the informant who seems appropriately credible for Jenny's true belief. So, there have been responses to this kind of case as well. So, one of the responses to say that, well, look, we don't say that people know no matter what, no, you know, just no matter what someone says, um, if you believe it and it turns out to be true, then you can have knowledge. We don't, we don't say that. Um, and actually, for it to be plausible that Jenny knows, we can say that 
well, she has to be doing some things, um, or at least she has to be counterfactually sensitive to some things. And also, if she would just select absolutely anybody um, to ask, so she would, you know, she could have even asked someone who is obviously completely intoxicated. Um, then again, we, sh we should withhold um, attribution of knowledge. So the response is to say, well, there is a contribution um, from the testimonial recipient. If we're going to say that they have knowledge, there is some, some contribution. So Greco conceives of, of an ability as being by nature reliable, so remember we said that. Uh, therefore, when we say that the recipient of testimony is exercising ability in the way it's described, it is a reliable ability that Greco has in mind. This is what makes it hard for, for Greco. But he's committed to saying that the person has to believe because of ability, and he's conceiving ability as being reliable. So when Greco writes that in order for an agent to gain testimony knowledge, that agent must be a reliable receiver of testimony, what he has in mind is that the agent must be exercising a cognitive ability that reliably produces true testimonial uh, based beliefs. Um, so we might just, the first thing to say is we might just worry that it doesn't seem very plausible that we do uh, have such abilities that make us reliable receivers of testimony. That we have the ability such that we will be able to discriminate and mostly get a, get a preponderance of true beliefs over, over false beliefs, just based on our abilities as a recipient. Uh, this, is a, this is a different uh, concern. So this is actually what motivates uh, Greco to go from what's called simple process reliabilism uh, to agent reliabilism. Um, so there, there was this view, um, you know, some people might still be defending it, there's this view that, um, well, what's needed is just that someone formed their belief on the basis of a reliable process. That's all. Just on the basis of reliable process. Um, but there are these, these counter examples as they to say, no, uh, it's not good enough just forming your belief on the basis of a reliable process. And actually, Greco himself appeals to those examples to motivate going from simple process reliabilism to agent reliabilism to his virtue epistemic account. Uh, so, some of the examples are strange and fleeting processes uh, may be the cause of true beliefs reliably being produced. True beliefs formed by such processes, however, are generally taught not to be knowledge. Um, agent reliabilism has an advantage over simple process reliabilism in that it avoids counter examples to which the latter form of reliabilism is vulnerable. Okay, so this is an example. Um, this is a, an example of a, a fleeting process. So there's this careless math student, um, and he forms his belief about. So he he, um, he has this um, belief about what the correct algorithm is for a problem, um, and he forms it on the basis of a whim. If we want to fill out the case, we could say that maybe. Um, he thinks that he has a great um, mathematical intuition and that's why he forms the belief about the algorithm on the basis of supposing himself of great intuition, uh, mathematical intuition. In any case, uh, so he has this um, belief about the, the correct algorithm and it just turns out that the algorithm is right. And the algorithm reliably you know, given that it's right, it's reliably giving them correct answers to, to math, math problems. Um, so just, just by hypothesis, he's forming his belief on the basis of reliable process when he's forming his belief on the basis of the algorithm. The algorithm is correct. Um, but it seems wrong to say that he knows um, the answer to the various math problems then. So he's got 
he's, he's getting true beliefs. He's got a true belief. Let's pick, take, take a particular one. He's got a true belief in the case. He's forming it on the basis of a reliable process. Potentially, he couldn't himself to rely on this process. Sorry? He couldn't him, himself to rely on this process. He doesn't think actually that it is a really reliable process to solve that. No, we, we want to say that he does he does think it, right? Because we want to say that he's meeting the different conditions, so he's believing the answers. And so we can say that he thinks that he has this great mathematical intuition. Um, and that's why he's going to believe the answers when he applies the algorithm. But maybe <clears throat> no mathematician... Uh... He's, he's a student, so he's not, you know, he's not a serious mathematician. <laughs> Some of them are intuitionists, uh, and they can agree that all of them ha have no idea about which algorithm is correct. Yeah. In mathematics, we cannot uh, decide this problem universally. Okay, well, let me stipulate that. Um, look, if he was a diligent, hard-working student, he would have taken the long way and in this particular case, there was a, a way of finding out what the correct algorithm was. But he doesn't do that. He, you know, he's just, maybe he got a great mark on his last test, and then he's convinced that he's this mathematical genius, and he just um, forms his belief about the answer on the basis of his intuition that, oh, this is, this is the, the correct algorithm in this case. Um, and he, so he really believes this. It looks like when he's forming, when he's applying that algorithm, and uh, getting various results. He's getting a true, he's getting triplets, and it's on the basis of reliable process. It turns out that the algorithm is right. Is right. Um, but we shouldn't want to say that the person has knowledge. We shouldn't want to say that the student has knowledge. What's the difference between uh, using an algorithm uh, which uh, has been chosen by intuition mm -hmm. and uh, solving the problem? Relying on mere intuition, without any algorithm. What's the difference? So why is intuition in one case okay and not in another? Is that the question? Um, in this case, uh, it seems to me that a math student uh, yeah. choose, choose, yeah, just choose, choose uh, an algorithm by intuition. Yeah. Uh, and what if he decided mere to uh, solve the test uh, by intuition? Uh, uh, so every answer that he uh, wrote was uh, merely intuitive. Uh, what's the difference? Uh, what's what's the need for? Do 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 we really need an algorithm here? And if he's so prodigy, prodigy if he's a great mathematician, he doesn't even use algorithm. His brain just calculates and he simply uh, <laughs> looks at the answer. Maybe he um, work, work out this uh, yeah. algorithm thousand times and now he doesn't even... I, I don't want to say that it's not possible um, that there could be a great uh, mathematical genius and that they actually, their the mathematical intuition would reliably give them triplets. I don't want to deny that's possible. Um, but actually, in this case, I just want to say, or you know, the case is used to show that um, someone can have a true belief, and the true belief could be formed on the basis of a reliable process. Um, in this case, on the basis of an algorithm that is correct, um, but we wouldn't want to say that the person has knowledge. Um, so let me try and address um, what you were saying. Um, So the reason we want to talk about algorithms is because just because if someone is using an algorithm and it's the right algorithm, you know, presuming they know how to use it, they will be able to reliably get the right answers. Um, but if we just say that this person has a dodgy intuition and they form their beliefs on the basis of their dodgy intuition, then they're not forming their beliefs on the basis of a reliable process. So we, it's, it's supposed to be a counterexample uh, to the idea that and knowledge is truly formed on the basis of reliable processes. Okay. 
So Greco can say that S doesn't know um, as S has not gained true belief because of ability. But what Greco says about this case, so let me say a bit more about this. So, so it's part of Greco's account that, look, it's, knowledge isn't just based on uh, true beliefs on the basis of reliable processes. It has to be on the basis of abilities. And abilities are something that's uh, grounded in the cognitive character of the agent. And um, so this is a case of a fleeting process. So someone happens upon this um, algorithm, and then it's reliably getting them uh, the right result. Um, but that's, that's not a, a worry for Greco, because Greco thinks that if, if um, there is knowledge, then it has to be the case that the person has formed a belief on the basis of abilities. Uh, Sarah, a four-year-old child, asks her mother where Lucky, the family dog, is. Um, her mother answers truthfully that her older brother, Paul, has taken Lucky for a walk. Sarah believes her mother and intuitively, Sarah knows. Um, both Greco and Pritchard, they want, they want it to be the case. They've said, you know, they've said this in print that um, young children can gain testimonial knowledge. But this looks really hard. It looks hard to see how this is possible on, on Greco's account and actually on Pritchard's account as well. Um, so from what we know about young children, it's just impossible to believe that Sarah has an ability that makes her a reliable recipient of, should be of testimony, of testimony. So, young children, you'll, you know, if you have experience with young children, so, uh, you know, not so long ago, I was in a car with my niece, and she kept crying and crying, and it was quite stressful, and, you know, I told her, oh, look, you see the giraffe, do you see the hippopotamus, and she believed me. She, young children will believe almost anything they're told, and so it's just not plausible that they have some kind of ability that makes them a reliable recipient of testimony. But if we want to say that they have knowledge, then what are we going to say? That's, that's a, it's a problem for, for Greco's again. So the problems recap then are the challenges. Um, the Jenny and Sarah type testimony cases, uh, Barney type cases, and providing a well-motivated account. So actually, um, the way Pritchard puts this is he says that um, in one sense, Greco's account is too strong. It's too strong in that it seems to rule out these cases, but we want to say that these are cases of knowledge. And in another sense, it's too weak. Um, it allows this case, it seems to allow this case to be a case of knowledge, even though Greco doesn't want to say it is.